Um, one. We don't miss any questions. Sir. Okay, so uh, today uh, I'm going to be talking about some important elements of test design. This is a, a topic that's going to occupy us for the next few lectures. Okay, and it's really about um, investing in your test to ensure that they have enough depth to be likely to show show bugs in any given area and enough breadth that they're likely to pick up very different types of defects okay or quality problems um i say defects but again testing is about more than defects what are some things testing might pick up other than a defect other than a bug what are some problems just to remind ourselves yeah uh, uh, jeremy uh yeah poor design yeah um so it can be really awkward. If it's really awkward to execute certain tests, uh, say using the, the testing interface, that may be a sign it's really awkward to undertake some tasks. And so the UI design might be flawed, right? Confusing, uh, ugly, uh, problematic. It may also reveal some aspects of the API that are just kind of not really good fits uh, for the current situation. What other things besides uh, a strict defect or, or bug might there be? Yeah. Uh, wrong and name again? Sid. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay. So so functionality that's that's off base. We wouldn't call that a bug, right? Because we often distinguish between did you so. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll do it this way. Um, so some tests are about testing. Um, does the design match the requirements? Okay. Um, and this is, did you build the right system? Uh, and then other types of, of tests you're interested in might be asking, do the does the implementation match the design? Okay. Um, and, and that's a question of did you build the system right? Um, so this question of did we build the right system? Like um, you know, is this the system the user actually wants? Like, is this the system? That the stakeholders care about, um, and and per the requirements given to us, these are about okay. Given that we had to build a certain system, did we build it correctly? Um, taken as a given, the design that we put into place, you know, does our implementation match that? And this is commonly what we think of as a bug, right? We write a less than sign and set the less than or equal to. It's a bug, but there could be cases which uh, which don't really fall into that, but where we have a mismatch in other areas. Um, so you know the functionality is wrong. It's, it's a, excellent. So anything else? Um, yeah. Can I have the same on the other half of the way? Yeah. 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 So um, absolutely, that'll be a. Contribution to the class. Um, there you go. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for, for pointing that out. It totally missed. Uh, any, any other types of issues? Again, there's a whole host of like um, non functional requirements issues. Things like, is it incredibly slow, right? Does it take a really long time to respond? Um, these aren't bugs per se but there may be aspects of the user experience that are um not sustainable that are, that are not acceptable right um also things about the user interface this is kind of building on jeremy's comment about you know maybe a wrong design you could talk about the technical design but you can also talk about the ui design and and maybe it's uh the ui design is really off-putting problematic you know it uses hideous colors or there's a misspelling is it a bug no it's not a bug but it's you know it's, it's a problem okay so we're going to be talking though about, about tests here 
that are designed to, to help us identify problems of various sorts. And actually what was mentioned just now, um, you know, by, by Jeremy, uh, some by Sid, is a good reminder that, you know, we have these kind of different levels of planning for a system. We elicit the requirements. We, we draw out the user on their requirements often forcing them to think about things they never really thought about. Um, we, we build an architecture for the system. Uh, maybe it's a model view controller system. Maybe it's, a, it's an architecture based on layers or based on a sort of tree-based decomposition. We have medium and high level design, and then we have sort of low level design. This might be you know, what each function takes as arguments. This might be the classes and how they cooperate. You know, sort of what class is going to work with what, and this gets into the lowest level gets into you know what's the details of what they call, etc. Um, let's get this uh, get get this down there. Okay. Um, and the point is that each of these can be tested with certain types of tests. So at the lowest level, the ones you're most familiar with, we have unit tests. You sort of test you know each function and you know, so right. So, does it do what it's supposed to do according to its specifications or according to the intentions behind it? Hopefully, their specifications. By medium level design, you can have integration tests. That's where things have to fit together. This class has to play nicely with this other class to accomplish this task, for example. Or these sets of functions are used together in a coherent way to accomplish something. Um, it's not about any one piece. It's about how the pieces come together to, to coordinate to solve the problems. Um, and you have integration tests because this is a, the types of issues you're trying to identify are not issues in any one piece. It's issues that come up with incompatibilities and assumptions or whatever. At the higher levels, sort of the, the architecture and the use cases, you've got system tests. So to put the system through its paces in common use cases, for example. Maybe this is through the user interface. So you, you're, you're, you know, you're creating the system, maybe it's in React Native, maybe it's in Flutter, but you're, you're getting automated tests running through the user interface. By through, I mean, it's as if it's a human user there, but it's entering various things and, seeing the response and measuring whether it's correct. In a React Native from Jest, I think you have this snapshot testing where you're sort of testing HTML that comes back against what you expect, et cetera. In other platforms like Selenium, you have ways of testing, uh, testing to see if the user interface is responding to the requests you made in the right way. So you submit forms, you see responses, you compare them, blah, blah, blah. And then requirements of acceptance tests that can sort of validate that the requirements, you know, that it carries this out um, in the system. And what I'm not showing here is regression testing that we'll talk about right now. Regression testing doesn't quite fit into this V model of testing. What do I expect from you, project wise? Um, well, you know, I'd really like to be a lot of unit tests, no question about it. Um, definitely want to see system tests. I love seeing integration tests. They show a thoughtful attention to how things interact. Because you know, our systems are about building things that interact to accomplish some task. So normally there's at least some integration tests. And in fact, trying to do unit tests without integration requires what sort of technology a lot of the time. Because so much we have these things where A depends on B depends on C or depends on D, or you know that maybe maybe there's also network of dependencies here. Um, when we have this, it's almost easier to do integration testing, or it's it's very natural to do it. What does it take to do unit testing or something like this? Yes, Larissa. Mocking. So if you want to kind of carve out you know, does A work without getting into, sorry, does C work without getting into whether A works? 
use Montaigne to kind of pretend it's an A and as far as it deals with C. Or when you're an A, you kind of draw this boundary around it and you pretend like you have a C, pretend like you have a B, pretend like you have a D, and you see if A works. And that's that would be more like unit testing um, with mocking. Okay, it's sort of it's sort of unit, you're testing that unit in and of itself, mocking out the things around it. Testing this out sort of on its own, testing out its functions in a unit-like way, while it's calling other things, it's really more like unit integration testing. It's kind of like you're focused on one thing, but you're letting it call other things. And so if there's a bug in one of these other things, there's a bug in B, it'll show up as if it's a bug in A, right? Like A won't match what's expected, right? It might not be A's fault per se, it's the fault of B, but it would show up here. So we might think of it as unit testing, but we're really testing the full structure. Do people understand that? Do you understand why that is? Look, if A is calling off to B to do some tasks, and there's a bug in B, couldn't it be that A is, has a faulty return value as a result? Yeah. Good, right? Um, you expect A to do X, it actually does Y, but it's not sometimes it's not because of a problem in A, it's because of a problem in something it calls, right? Common, fairly common thing. And if you just test A, like it's code by itself, that's unit integration testing because you're testing these other things. And if you find an issue, you have to be cognizant of the fact that it may not live in A per se. The issue may be over in C or over in B or over in B, right? Mm -hmm. If you really want to test A by itself, mocking is the name of the game. There's like the rest of stuff. Okay. People have an understanding of that, why that is. And, you know, especially if A depends on a lot of things, then, you know, there might be real difference in terms of how quickly you might debug an issue if you're doing mocking on an app to, to deal with the other things around A, true unit testing of A versus unit integration testing. Truth is, I'm not going to be that picky about that. I'm not going to say you did unit integration testing and you didn't do proper unit testing. I'll, I'll cut you some slack there, but I do want to see you know some attempt to make sure things play together nicely and things are being tested at least on their own. At least you're doing unit integration testing, even if you're not doing always strict unit testing. And I do want to see mocking. I do want to see mocking, in place, right? Um, these days, mocking is so much easier. Uh, you know, uh, it, it used to be, believe me, much harder. Okay, let's talk about regression. So, so you recall, I, I don't want to spend much time on this because we, we mentioned the essential ideas. Regression is when a change breaks a feature, of, uh, breaks a feature in operation that previously worked or, or, um, or reveals a previous bug. The system goes backwards. Right? Because it used to be fixed, used to be worked, no longer does. So it regressed. We thought we were further ahead and it's gone back. <laughs> okay. Now um when we have a we have tests, often a real life project over the course of a couple of years, it's gonna it's gonna build up a huge number of regression tests. Because every bug you fix, you might try to add to your regression suite a test to make sure it's still fixed. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of these tests. And you want to make sure that the features that were working before or have been working along still work. Because those are the features most counted on right? by the end user. And so sometimes we don't run those regression, all those regression tests in each build we do them separately and and you know there's sometimes said to be a regression test gap if 
there's a difference between the current test suite and the entire test suite that's ever been run. That we dropped out some tests that we no longer do, and maybe we have some gaps in it. Um, and, and some gaps where we'll have a regression that um, that occurs without us realizing it. Um, and you know, I emphasized before. Look, when when it takes to uh, to delivering value, you know, um, having an exist a new feature that works or that doesn't work is is bad for the user. They're disappointed. This new feature they were hoping to be nice and shiny and they could use doesn't work, right? That's a disappointment. Um, but what's worse is if the existing feature breaks, right? Um, and what's really bad is if it's detected by post-release. So it's detected by an end user. Does any broken their function? I made this point before. I don't think I need to make it again. And, and the point here is in terms of regression, in terms of old bugs coming about, I mentioned this verbally, but just to emphasize it, you know, if you're making changes of less than 10 statements, about 50% of bug fixes work. Think about that. You've got a coin flip chance from studies suggest of fixing a problem that only involves 10 or so lines correctly. Modic communications that are bigger than that, like, up, like 50 statements, about 20% of the bugs work. When I say bug fixes work, what I mean is they don't introduce a new bug. It's correct. It's fully correct. Often, half the time for small changes, 80% of the time for big changes, they introduce another bug. And, you know, there's some reasons about that, right? Um, you squeeze here, you pop out there, misunderstanding the bug report, uh, you misrecalled when you thought it was fixed and it really wasn't, the job wasn't done. Uh, or you have logical reasoning problems that come up during it. You try to fix it here, and it's inconsistent with something else, and it, it, you know, it, it, you knock it back. This is, this is a repeated problem, and the issue is when you these are bugs that you're fixing that you know about. The bugs that that may come in their place that get introduced without you realizing it are ones you don't know about. So you've traded the devil you know for the devil you don't know. And when you get close to a, a deadline, like a deliverable, this becomes a real kill because, you know, do you fix it? Seems so tempting to fix, but how if we introduce something? At least this bug, we know we can put a worker in, a workaround in it, because we know where it is, how it manifests, how to, how to prevent it. The bug that goes in its place, we don't know. That's the risk. That's the risk. Okay. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's a big big issue, and I give some reasons. You know, these things for merge merge conflicts are one of the bigger ones, etc. Um, okay. Um, so you know, common regression testing problem um, patterns here are testing all previously found and closed defects in the one the present. This requires writing automated tests generally for things that are fixed. Maybe it was found by a tester manually, but when you're gonna fix it, you put in place an automated test to make sure it's, it's fixed. So can you run. Maybe you, uh, you, know, you test for similar bugs. You try to learn from a bug and, and move forward. Um, you know, it's a lesson in life. Um, when we make mistakes, there's a part of us that doesn't want to admit it. But, you know, a really healthy attitude towards life is to ask, you know, how can I do better next time? How can I learn from this? How could I prevent similar things from coming in the future? And how could I do better in, in, in uh, detecting them sooner if, it, if it's going on? So I can learn from them in terms of of going as far without noticing them. So how to prevent them, how to how to learn from them in terms of uh, discovering when I made the mistake mistake again so I can cut it off and, and correct it. Um, you turn a failure into a success in that way. 
a, a failure of some sort, you turn into an opportunity to learn that's successful. That's a healthy attitude. You know, how can I do better next time? Um, okay. Um, so, you know, here you can test for similar bugs, try to learn from these. You can also test uh, for sort of other features. But, um, you know, I, I talked about these levels. I really want to get to these issues of, um, of, of sort of detailed test design. But um, I, I guess I should say, uh, in terms of that V, that V level of testing or V diagram for testing, unit tests are most commonly put into place by developers, okay? Most unit tests on systems are written by developers. Amongst other things, if they're practicing test-driven development, they got to write unit tests beforehand, right? Actually, more like unit integration tests. But the point is, they're, they're testing out that when they write it, you know, does it accomplish its functionality? Okay. Integration testing uh, is also most commonly conducted by developers, but can be tested by can be written by some testers as well. It's often undertaken at different levels. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's quite common that you have these areas of the program that are essentially test hooks related to this or stubs or, or drivers um, that will put parts of the system through, the, through its paces. Um, okay, um, system testing, I just wanted to emphasize. So often system tests are the really expensive tests. They're the tests that require going through the UI, putting the system through its paces, uh, through the UI, or calling on the API, the things that get would get called if you went through the API, do this, do that, blah, blah, blah. You call those directly from code. So one option is you come through the UI. So, um, So here you have a system and maybe you have a UI by the system, you know, you have users um, and uh, like an eyeball uh, uh, and you have hands here um, and uh, they're interacting with the UI, right? Um, and you can have a, a test script here, which calls, calls off uh, through Selenium or through some other um, through other mechanism, water, you know, web application testing, and Ruby is another fun one. So a test for right? Um, and it may throb buttons on the page and fill in, you know, fields and uh, select things and drop downs, whatever, right? Um, so you can have an automated set of test scripts do this. Right? You write these test scripts, they're Selenium scripts or water scripts or JRobot scripts or whatever it is. And they frog these components and they press the submit button, right? Um, like done or whatever. Um, and it's just like a user, right? That's going through the UI. Hmm? And test scripts can do that. Well, these, these packages like Selenium. And this is a good option. Very resource intensive. Very resource intensive um, to write these scripts, to run them. Sometimes you have to run emulators, right? Like emulators for Android or emulators for iPhone, right? In order to run these scripts. And that can be quite expensive. The other option, so these would be like UI tests or through the UI. They're testing through the UI. They may be seeking to test things under the covers here, you know, how the system is implemented, the various modules, but they're testing through the UI. Mm -hmm. uh, the other possibility is you have other system tests that are not, that are not testing through the UI. I'll, I'll just call these through the UI, meaning, like their goal may not be to test whether the UI is correct. Their goal is to test whether the system is correct. They just operate through the UI, right? Like a lot of the tests that testers write or the tester perform exploratory testing, 
they're not necessarily trying to make sure the UI implementation is correct. They may be trying to make sure the system as a whole does the right thing, returns the right values, undertakes the right you know actions when you press it. But then there's you know system tests that don't go through the UI. And you know, often what happens is you know when you're filling in the UI. Um, when things happen, it's calling off to elements here. Maybe, maybe you have a controller module, or maybe you have, you know, a, a module associated with the model in a model view controller context, MVC context. You have a model which has various functions that reflect business logic and stuff like that. And often the user, the, the UI will call off to these things when there's user attitudes. You say, hey, model, do this, update that, you know, query this, give me back this info, right? Like a UI will, the UI shouldn't have this logic in it. It shouldn't have business logic in the UI. The UI falls much quicker than business, business logic. The line of business logic, the logic of kind of how your clients you know the 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 sort of field you're you're characterizing. Maybe it's data collection and um, and child care centers. Maybe it is uh, things involving at risk youth and risk assessment and so on. That 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 logic shouldn't be in the UI. This is part of this notion of separation of concerns. That's in and maybe a model area of the of the uh, the system where you have various things that are kind of domain specific that you're interacting. The point is, the UI often called off to these things. The system tests might call off to these things directly. Calling through the API that is used by the UI rather than calling going through the UI itself. Do you understand that distinction? So look, I mean, you can interact with it through the UI like as if you're a user. That's one way test scripts could offer. But you could also write test code. This is code, right? Maybe it's code in JavaScript or Java or, you know, in, in TypeScript uh, or kind of JavaScript with types, or maybe it's in uh, Kotlin or, or maybe it's in Dart uh, or it's, you know, whatever, choose your programming language in Rust. But these tests, are testing directly by calling the API that is otherwise called by the web UI or the, the, the app UI. So those are two different types of system tests. Both can test use cases, right? You could go through the user interface and put it through its user, its test case, its use cases. One way, you can also write test scripts that call directly. Okay. Um, two different types of system tests. Of these two, this is the more expensive because it's got to go to the UI and be running, you know, running mechanisms which basically interact with the UI, press buttons, system and render it. This is often somewhat less expensive. You can call directly. The other option, the other benefit here is that this often will have access to test hooks. The test won't. This is going entirely through the UI, just like the user tester testing something out. They observe what's going on through the UI. It's all through the lens of the UI. This can call off the thing directly and query, you know, what's the state of the database, or you know, what's uh, what things have been performed in the model so far, what happened. They can call off and log information. More flexibly than can these sort of test scripts through UI test scripts. Two different types of system tests. These are both system tests. Okay. Any questions about that distinction? Because, you know, generally I'd, I'd like to see both. Yes, Ren. Uh -huh. uh, when you're talking about expensive, how yeah. expensive, what do you mean in terms of time or in terms of scale? A very good question. I'm talking generally. Performance in terms of like the time needed to undertake the task. Um, like here, you might have a task completion in you know half or quarter of the time end to end, like stopwatch time that that this might take. 
Generally, this requires more space requirements, memory requirements as well, because you're rendering the UI. You're, you know, it's it's doing UI stuff here. Whereas here, what you're doing is more at the model level. It doesn't have to go through the UI. I mean, these things shouldn't care directly about the UI. They shouldn't be driving the UI. That's part of this idea of separation of concerns, right? We have a database layer, maybe we have a model layer, we have a UI layer, is one way to do it, or we have model view controller, and we allow swapping in different views and different controllers for like how user interface um, actions are undertaken, and that's separate from the model, which is kind of more core. It doesn't evolve with everything you are. If you have different different types of systems on which this runs, maybe it's a app on a phone, maybe it's a web UI, maybe they make use of the same model system. But the point is that um, this, like dealing with the UI, takes a level of processing uh, and a level of memory beyond what. Um, is strictly needed to deal with these requests. And so system tests undertaken at the API level, where you're actually programmatically, you'll hear me use this term, because it's a program, you're programmatically, you know, um, uh, engaging in system tests. These, these are often less resource intensive both the time and the So, answer your question. Other questions about this distinction? Because I like to see both sorts. Um, it's it's upper, it's money left on the table. It's opportunities not taken if you only have UI tests, like or through UI tests. If all if the entire view of your testing is through the UI, it's harder for you to test certain things. Um, it's kind of like the difference between, you know, interacting with the world just by looking out this window versus interacting with the world by going outside and, and you know, uh, checking out what's around, et cetera. We have access to more information at this level. Than we do here. Is this good? This is great. Give me great view with three UI tests. If you give me awesome three UI tests and none of these API ones, I'll be a bit disappointed, but I'll still be pretty happy with the testing. Um, I still say, you know, you did a pretty good job. When you've left money on the table, um, you could have done an even greater job. You did a good job, not a great job. If you do it with both, now we're talking because now we're we have the extra flexibility um, to to operate at both levels. And if the UI changes, guess what happens? Often these these what we change because you know this what used to be one screen what used to be one form is now broken up into three different forms. This may have to change. This may not change as much. Hopefully, the API is more stable than the UI. UIs evolve a lot. Underlying APIs, hopefully a bit slower. And so these tests tend to stay on the test of time a little bit better. But the truth is with automated tests in general, compared to doing a, a, a sort of interactive test, a, a manual test, so called, versus a test script, or a test script that's automated, we call it automated test. You want to guess which takes more work? Which takes more work? A test writing, like over its lifetime, dealing with a test script for something or manual tests for something. How much, how much human time is required to do this test once versus to write a, a script and, and deal with that script from then on? Yes, Rampton. Okay, the branch script is, is more convenient. Why is it convenient? It's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's 
True. And so you can run it just before the deliverable. You could run it. Just you know, every time there's a bill, you can run it. Very flexible in that regard. But it is vulnerable to needing change, right? There, there is that risk that it will need change, it will break. And often, in fact, these, these um, programmatic tests, these tests, you know, either this type or this type, one of the big downsides of them that we have to remember compared to manual tests is that they have to evolve and they take time to evolve. There's extra effort to evolve them as the system evolves. They, they, they require ongoing maintenance as the system changes, they change. But the UI changes generally more quickly than the API. So these ones have a little bit more resilience, a little bit more robustness, a little bit less quick change. Um, this is a different, different type of, two different types of system tests are in here. And you could say both of these are programmatic because there's code that are driving it, but, but um, you know, this, this is one I, I term especially programmatic and it's going through the API. It's going through the same sort of calls the UI is going to call off to, but lots of other calls you can make as test hooks to double check. Is this sane? Is that in the correct state? Was that performed? You can log stuff more um, more flexibly than it can the UI. So the UI, you're just dealing with the user view of the program, which could be pretty difficult to, to figure out. Is, is everything behind the scenes working properly? Hmm? Is that different than black box testing? Glass box test that we're about to get to. Yeah. 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 Why would you do UI maintenance? Anyone? Why would you do, why would you write test scripts to go through the UI? Yeah, Lee. You want to make sure the UI works. Yeah, you do. It's like there are some tests that are not just through the UI, but you're actually testing that the UI is operating properly, right? The, the UI is doing its job. So, and you might test that end to end in terms of black box experience. Like if, like if you didn't know what was going on here, you could at least for requirements, you can be testing through the UI, right? Like through the UI, you should be able to be pretty clear that the requirements are being met because it's being delivered to the user through the UI. And so if they, but if it ain't delivering on the requirements of the UI, it ain't delivering, right? Uh, value. So so testing through the UI is important. It's not a it's not a sort of just nice to have. It's actually really important to have. Um, and it's a big advantage, uh, like you said, in terms of flexibility, because you can run these things uh, very quickly and make sure the requirements are still being met. The, you know that the use cases do the right thing as presented to the UI. You don't know if the bug is in the UI or below sometimes, but you want to make sure it's giving the right the right result. Yeah, the reset. Um, it also lets you like make sure it looks nice, like rather than um, yeah, if you're only automating it, it's giving the right value. Yeah, that's right. Um, so you want to make sure that the UI is presenting it correctly. Um, and again, that, that gets to, you know, is, is the UI functioning as it should, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and, and that guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the uh, UI is just about uh, uh, testing it. What about uh, the uh, uh, purely through? So so these are, that's a really good question. The test script generally is not going to have a very good, unless you're like really conscious about putting it in there in some clever way or some deliberative way. Um, the test scripts are going to have a hard time judging user experience. There might be some aspects. To me, one thing that you might test through a test script that would be very important to the user experience. Beyond, you know, above in the result. Beyond that, what what could you, in principle, test through this? Yeah, Lee. You can test the performance. Yeah. How long? 
Yeah, you can test the response time, right? How long did it take between you submitted this and you got an answer back? So you say, find my flight. And you'd like to know, you know, uh, did it take five seconds to return that or 50 seconds or five minutes? That's a big difference. So you could test that through testing, right? Through the UI. That's a good thing to test. But there's going to be other aspects of user experience. So there's just so many of them, so many that it's not going to pick up, right? And certainly this is not going to pick it up, like this level of testing. But even this one is going to have a hard time picking up something that's really hideously ugly, or it has this misspelling in it, right? Um, or that's confusing, right? Like it has two buttons labeled the same, or, you know, um, there's a button that's really not visible because it's way over to the side of the form, or, you know, you have to click this, click that, and click that to even see the basic options, or whatever it is. There's lots of elements that kind of user experience that are just not captured they're not tested easily in tester and who do you need looking for those you, sorry did someone say something though yes Bob. yes the quality assurance team should be looking for the, the test team they should be looking for those sort of aspects of user experience so it's absolutely critical that you have manual testing going on too. So there should be some manual tests in your system. I definitely want to see some manual tests. And I want to see some automated tests. And neither is a replacement for the other. It's not like manual tests or a you know a poor substitute for automated tests. And it's not that automated tests are kind of a um you know, you could do away with manual tests. No, 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 you need both. And often, Emeka, for your question, like when you spot certain things with doing manual tests, and that gives you a clue for what might be an automated test you might try. Like you notice it's really slow around these sorts of queries. Or, or you know, um, it's, it's giving a result which is a bit surprising for something. Maybe it's technically correct, but it clues you in to some interesting test cases that might, you know, show some some uh, ideas. So testers, they should be going back and forth between these. Think about manual tests to undertake. These can be exploratory. Like a test script, what does it run? It runs this set of instructions, right? It's just like a recipe. So it does this, 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 this. Um, manual test, you can follow your nose. Gosh, that's slow. That was weird. That gave me something strange. Is that right? Um, and you start going into there more detail. Um, you know, oh, look, it truncated that name, right? It turned, maybe, maybe there's a long name, and it truncated it. You start to think, hmm, when could that cause trouble? I wonder if... You know, it would do that with this sort of thing, um, or maybe it maybe it eliminates you know special characters in the name. So if you have a name with an apostrophe, D'Angelo, or something like that, um, it cuts it out, and you start to think. I didn't know there was a requirement, but maybe that should be something we talk about. So manual and automated tests, like these two, should be undertaken together. Um, when I say together, like the tester should be going back and forth between. When they find a problem that's manual test, when they find a failure, someone's got to write an automated test to find it to, for the regression, right? To make sure it's really fixed. And, so. and often those are written through the UI. Um, here's another thing, uh, Brandon. Um, so, you know, although we have manual tests, so we're doing some exploratory tests, very important. Do some exploratory testing. I'll be doing exploratory testing on your system. Get my phone. Um, and uh, you know, I, I'll look forward to exploring that. But once you find a problem with exploratory testing, generally you put an automated uh, system in for it. But but in the meantime, you know, or or for that automated system, you might do a UI one, right? Because it's very straightforward. If, if you have in mind a 
problem that you saw with, uh, with manual testing. I went and I pressed this button, I clicked that, I did that, I did this, chose this thing to drop down. I went two screens later and I saw this weird thing, you know. Um, if you if you see that, it's quite easy to write a script for it, you all know, it might be harder to figure out what's that calling underneath the surface, what API calls are going on, and write one of these. That requires more work. And it might, um, sorry, write one of these. And it might require consulting with the devs, right? Like about what's going on. Whereas testers can often write these pretty easily. Not that testers couldn't, in principle, write these. It's just they got to understand how it's implemented, right? Like what calls off to what. And here for the UI, it might be a bit easier to translate a manual test case that failed into a to a test script. Any any questions about that? More. So I am I am counting on having annual tests and automated tests within your system. I want to see some annual tests and some automated tests. Yes, Bob. You know, but fully my son has an example. If you use the max test, it'll pass. But if we do the automated test, it fails. Mm -hmm. Basically, we cannot manually reproduce the box. This can't happen, can't it? Yeah. Bring all the automated condition. Exactly. You said the exact correct purpose. Yeah. It's it's in race conditions. And often that indicates um problems with handling concurrency. Um you're not you're not rigorously handling concurrency. Um uh it can indicate you know a problem that could come up with a manual user in in the right circumstance. Like you may say, oh come on, you know. Um, an automated test, this thing will be 100 milliseconds apart, these two actions. Whereas with a manual test, it'll be at least you know, a longer period of time apart. But maybe if the system is really slow because it has lots of users on it, you know, um, now this problem will be manifested not only in things that are 100 milliseconds apart, but things that are, you know, uh, two seconds apart, three seconds apart, and then it all falls apart, right? And we've all seen that. I mean, probably everyone in here has encountered a site that's overburdened. Too many users, right? Web traffic is bursty. And my gosh, I mean, this is what we want, right? If we want a website, we want tons of people come to it. So we want heavy load on it because it's getting noticed and you know, it's our time in the sun and we're selling product or whatever, and, and that's our time to shine. And, and then it can get slow and these things that would have been impossible really for a, for a manual user start to become really, really quite possible. Um, you, you start to see these race conditions with different users interacting with it because things are so slow. And that's when things can go down. In, in bad ways. And when you need to shine, it's, you know, it's bad. It's where the sun don't shine. Um, it's really, really, really bad situation. Okay. Um, so system tests are, are really important and, and you should be thinking about manual versions of them and automated versions of them, um, both types of tests. But, you know, you can have automated unit tests uh, as well that are, that are important and uh, should end up being part of this. Um, you know, once your requirements are stable, you can really think about system tests through the UI. Once, we're, once the design is stable, like all these pieces, how, it, how it's going to undertake these actions through the UI, then you can start these, these sort of API-based tests, right? But both are fragile. Both take a lot of effort. And as Ramton said, they're very flexible. You can run them like that, run the whole test suite instead of having six testers pounding on it. But, you know, these things break. UI evolves, then faster the API, but APIs evolve. So going from ID2 to ID3, or ID3 to ID4, or ID4 to ID5. Remember, all those are coming. Um, 
these things may change and suddenly my tasks that were nice and pretty and pristine and quick and flexible have to be updated. It happens a lot. So it's a bit about, a bit about testing. Um, race conditions. This is, this is uh, exactly what Bo was talking about. Um, and you want to try to reproduce these things. Um, there's some very nice work that's gone on here. In fact, um, when it comes to stress tests and load tests, this is a whole sub area of testing to make sure that your system shines when the interest in it is the greatest and you have the greatest uptake and use of it. You want to put your system through kind of these, these periods where it's stressed or where it's under high load. Those are a little bit different. By stress, I'm talking about things like the CPU is really, really slow or memory is short or disk is almost full. Um, where you know IO takes a long time to respond, network IO or, or writing writing to some you know server resource. Um, and, and you want to try to for the stress cases put it through this. Low tests are particularly common with web applications where you have many users at the same time and they're all hitting the site. Large load on the system. And sometimes that's accompanied by these stress conditions, like low memory, like you know, thrashing disk that causes the disk to be really to be really slow, uh, like uh, slow network connections because there's so much traffic. But but sometimes uh, load causes other sorts of issues uh, associated with web-based systems. So. You know, here the goal is to be to get into offensive testing, not offensive in the sense of obnoxious, but in the sense of going and finding the bugs before they find you. So try to make the program execute slowly, or try to force timeouts. Um, you know, you try pushing the number of files you have open, or limit your memory uh, run run program on on certain tasks for long periods. Uh, you folks presumably have heard about memory leaks, right? What's a memory leak? Anyone? What's a memory? Yeah, what is it? If you're allocating memory and then you don't free it again. Yeah, and what can what can occur uh, over time with that? So at first it may be invisible, right? You, you don't see it. But then what happens over time? Yeah, it, it can end up crashing it because the app heat access to heat memory gets exhausted and it ends up you know giving giving up right you can't get new memory allocated and it creeps up on you and you only see it if it runs for long periods of time maybe it runs requires running it overnight maybe it requires running it for two days straight whatever but it comes up and maybe it exhausts memory like we talked about, or file handles or database connections, any sort of resource can be exhausted. It can run out. You can, you can have no more of them, right? And they've just been lost along the way. And, you know, we think of modern languages like Java, JavaScript, you know, we don't have to call that old painful calic and malloc. You folks remember calic and malloc? Yeah. Um, so from C, right, you know, with, with these languages, we have garbage collection and so on. You might think you're past it, but in fact, you're going to use the right Java code that runs out of file handles or database handles and so on, because you don't clean up after yourself when certain operations happen or what have you. You don't close the file properly and it goes, goes open for long periods of time and then it runs out. Um, or you know transactions aren't properly closed. I don't know if you cover transactions in your web programming course, but transactions are associated with databases. You want a bunch of operations to occur together, and they either all all occur together, and you know it's like a a, a group of them, and the whole thing's atomic, and and it's like you're either viewing it before the whole set or after the whole set, 
or it fails and, and it's as if nothing changed. This is the idea of transaction. You haven't seen that before. It's a really important concept in database and in modern larger software systems that use databases. And you know, you can screw up your transaction handling. So don't think just because you've got a garbage collection now, you're free and clear. No, it's actually really easy to run out of resources. And so certain types of bugs only show up if you leave it for long periods of time with your system running, right? That these memory leaks will only manifest at that point. Um, so the idea is to, to put your system through through these paces. And there are testing devices, testing programs. We're going to finish up here for today. Testing programs that will put it through these paces, that will make it seem as if it's out of this space, seem as if it can't get a network connection for a certain period of time, seem as if you know the, the memory is full. And then you see what happens to your system. You know, what think about an Android app, right? Android app, um, maybe it wants some memory. Uh, if an Android app is in the background, it gets flushed, right? And, and, and other ones take its place. You want to be sure that that all works nicely when there's lots of apps running and stuff like that. You can't just assume your app is always going to be in the foreground. So you, you, you know, you put it through some trials. You, you make sure it works okay when the network's disconnected, right? When you're offline. So very basic things. These are elements of race, uh, of, of stress testing and load testing. And I'd like to see some basic elements of that in your. Uh, to, am I going to say you're building an app? You have to have load testing. No, but some of these apps uh, are are needing to coordinate many users, entering information at the child care center at the same time. Maybe you want to make at least sure that they work with 10 people entering information at the same time, because if they don't, bad news, right? Um, if it crashes. So, so think about this. So this is this is not. Is there a problem in function, you know, or, or the, the feature is broken? This is, does it work well under, under the sort of conditions under which it needs to shine or, or where it still needs to be robust? Okay. So that's all uh, for today. I'd love to uh, talk a little bit more, but next time we'll talk a little bit about testing, um, uh, testing, um, uh, with automation, but I want to talk about test cases, and I want to work with you to think about how do you pick good test cases. Fine, this is one of these areas where students are often lost. And a few basic principles can help you pick really hard hitting test cases. Take your limited test time and use it to greatest advantage. And with those words, I will complete this lecture, and I will meet you up in yonder by day in about five to ten minutes. Okay. Uh, today, team one is going first. So if team one wants to start getting ready, uh, that'll be great. Thank you.